Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and this presentation is titled A Truly Tragic Accident That Led to the Development of TCAS and Many Other Safety Enhancements. This is the crash of PSA Flight 182 that occurred on September 25th, 1978. Now, I remember this well because I was very nearby. I was up over the hill in Edwards Air Force Base, uh, Edwards, California there, uh, at the base of the Mojave Desert as a chase pilot uh, at the Flight Test Center. And this was, of course, all on the local news. At the time, I was going to be an Air Force pilot, and this was... Uh, an interesting airliner accident, as of course they all are, and I was a little bit, I was a pilot, but I'm more of an observer. I wasn't an airline pilot back then. But this accident, like many in this period, led to a lot of safety enhancements, including Class B airspace, which I'll uh, discuss if you're not uh, familiar with that. That was one of the enhancements. Now, this accident killed um, 135 people on board the aircraft, uh, and it also killed seven people on the ground. It crashed into a very populated area in San Diego. So seven people on the ground were killed, including two children. Um, nine others were also injured on the ground, and 22 residences were uh, damaged. It, uh, it produced quite, a, uh, quite an impact, and I'll show you. And there's an interesting aspect to the NTSB investigation. If you're familiar with the movie, uh, the 1957 movie with Henry Fonda, 12 Angry Men, about how one individual can change the course of a whole group. Uh, and there's an interesting aspect on the NTSB report, and uh, which kind of relates to this movie. This movie actually was also used uh, with our cockpit resource management training uh, to uh, parts of it were played to show um, what the effect of one person could have on a group. A very interesting movie if you haven't seen it. Now this is the PSA 727 involved in the accident. And this is the 172. Now, I've, I've done a lot of instruction in 172s when I uh, worked at the uh, uh, Cessna Flying Club. I was a, a, in flight test there at Cessna, and kind of as a side thing, I went over to the Cessna Flying Club and gave instruction. The nice thing about it is we would get brand new aircraft, some of the, the nicest aircraft you'd ever see. Uh, but I never owned a 172. I owned a 172RG to teach my son how to fly for the uh, uh, complex and uh, the instrument rating. Um, but, hey, I digress. Hey, one thing I'd like to say, thanks to all you guys who are watching now, um, I've got enough of you that I actually uh, have a sponsor. So I want to have a quick word from my sponsor here. Hey, let me tell you about my sponsor. I've been getting a lot of spam calls lately and I have to answer my phone because I've got rental properties. But more often than not, it's a solar panel salesman or a, a car warranty company on the other end. Even worse, I once got a call from someone pretending to be my grandson. When I asked him his name, he hung up. It's scary to think how easy scammers can access our information to use it to target us. And it's not just phone calls. I've had my credit card information stolen several times with fraudulent purchases showing up in the middle of the night. It's a violation of privacy and it leaves you feeling vulnerable and exposed. That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura is an all-in-one online security solution that helps protect my personal information and keep me safe from scams and fraud. With Aura, I can see what data brokers are selling my information and request to have it removed. Plus, I get alerted if my information shows up on the dark web or if there's suspicious activity on my accounts. Aura also includes a VPN to keep my online activity private, a password manager to create and store strong passwords, and even parental controls to keep your family safe online. And if the worst happens and my identity is stolen, Aura provides $1 million in insurance to help me recover. In today's digital age, protecting our personal information is more important than ever. Aura makes it easy to take control of your online security and privacy with one comprehensive solution. You can go to Aura.com slash Ron Rogers to start your two-week free trial, also linked below in the description. Don't wait until it's too late. Take action now to keep yourselves and your loved ones safe online. You won't regret it. Thanks for listening. 
Okay, here's the situation. Uh, this is from the accident report that was published in 79. I, it's very hard to read. I'll, I'll get a little uh, closer uh, blow up here and talk about a couple of the aspects. All right, here's blown up, still hard to read, but uh, the blue arrow is the 727, the PSA uh, 727 that was coming down from Los Angeles. Now, I have flown this route many times uh, in 737s, 727s, Airbus, uh, coming out of L.A. or San Francisco down. It's a, it's a very picturesque route, a uh, very pretty route, and you come in from the north, and you predominantly land on runway 27, which has a localizer-only approach, and anybody who knows about San Diego, it's uh, uh, with the parking garage there, it's always a, an interesting place to fly into and a lot of fun. Now, uh, the ILS, because of the terrain in that, you can't put an ILS uh, um, on runway 27, it's too steep. I mean, it works great for a C-17, but for most aircraft, it's a little too steep for a uh, precision approach. So uh, if you need to land with an ILS, and I've done that a few times, once in a while the weather's really bad, so you come in on 27. Well, uh, the 172 there uh, had just shot a uh, approach to runway 9 that had the ILS. They were doing practice uh, approaches. It was an instructor, uh, and a student. The student was working towards an instrument rating, so they're in the San Diego area uh, shooting uh, instrument approaches, uh, practice instrument approaches in VFR conditions. It was a bright sunny day in VFR conditions, and they're shooting approaches, and the 727 with the blue arrow is coming in uh, from the north. Now, these guys had gone missed approach, and this was back before airspace tightened down. Uh, the Cessna was told to fly a heading of 070. And as you can see from the, uh, the track there as it moves up, that's a 70 heading. Well, for unknown reasons, he turned to a 090 degree heading. Now, as you probably know, if you fly little airplanes, the heading can get away from you pretty fast. And being that he was a student, uh, you know, he and the instructor could have had a, a discussion. This is all speculation, but uh, for some reason, their attention may have wavered and he didn't tell the controllers that he was deviating from the heading. And there's a little con uh, um, discussion about whether he actually needed to do that. And uh, since this wasn't what later became Class B airspace, he wasn't required to. Um, the accident report concluded that if he had maintained his 070 degree heading, that they would have uh, passed each other by about a thousand feet. But unfortunately, uh, they had the heading and they uh, uh, ended up uh, impacting uh, the uh, 27 actually ran over the top of the 172, uh, more or less. It was a bit of an off angle. The, the, uh, they did a lot of studies on co cockpit uh, visibility in that, in like the 727, and they have the standard window displays they show and what you can see from the various seats. Uh, it gives you a distorted picture of the window. But... Uh, Part of the problem uh, with sea and avoid, and that's that's the big aspect of the accident here with sea and avoid, is that um, the aircraft that you are going to hit is the one that doesn't move in the windscreen. Now, this this is back when I was in the Air Force and we were doing turning, turning rejoins or rejoining on an aircraft. The way that you knew that you were going to rejoin on the aircraft was that you held him stationary in the uh, windscreen as you came up the line into position. So uh, that's how you knew you were going to impact him if you didn't slow down and go into uh, the wingtip position. So the aircraft you're going to hit is the one that's not moving in the windscreen. And of course, that's the most difficult one to see. The other aspect of that is, is the fact that that um, there was a lot of ground clutter. This is over a, a residential area, and so there's a lot of houses down there. The airplane had kind of a yellow uh, tint to it, and the houses, uh, being southwest, uh, had uh, that same uh, coloring to a, a lot of degrees. So you, you get the ground clutter. The um, airplane could be difficult to see, and the the other aspect of this is there was supposedly a third aircraft. Now, uh, when 
air traffic control says to you, they say, hey, uh, there's an aircraft, you know, uh, two o'clock low. Uh, do you have them? Well, you know, they want you to see them. They want you to maintain visual separation. But one of the worst things you can do uh, as far as a crew is say, yeah, I have them. Because now um, in a non-radar environment uh, where they're not controlling the other aircraft, uh, it's your duty to see and avoid. And if you've got an area where you got a lot of ground clutter, you better make sure you can see that guy. And you better make sure you're seeing the correct guy. Because if you're looking at the wrong aircraft and the guy that's the factor, uh, the collision factor, he's going to run right into you because you're focusing on this other guy. So it's really dangerous. So I'm very disinclined to say I have uh, that I can see an aircraft because it takes a lot of the responsibility off ATC depending on the situation and throws it on me and then the other thing is you got to maintain that you do see that aircraft so unless you know that you can see that aircraft very well and uh, it, this works you know well in the little airplanes like if I'm in my Cessna but uh, in a in a faster airplane it's much more dangerous because you can easily uh, lose sight of of the other aircraft so now let's talk about one of the safety enhancements that came out of this and it's called TCAS. That's terminal collision avoidance system. This works if the the airliner that typically has these systems on it uh, is able to interrogate uh, another aircraft that has a transponder uh, with mode C. Now, if you don't have a transponder with a mode C on the other aircraft, they're essentially invisible. But um, in these high traffic areas, uh, the aircraft are required to have that before they can enter. So it, it gives you a lot of benefit. And the uh, you, you've got various uh, positions uh, that you can see depicted here that uh, you have a cautionary and you get, uh, you'll get a caution warning on the, the TCAS system. Uh, and uh, if it gets into a warning area, it will it will tell you to take corrective actions, and these are things that you must follow. And this can be depicted in a number of ways. Here's the Airbus uh, depiction. Now, basically, what we have here is an aircraft just above us, uh, you know, on our altitude. Uh, or could be slightly above us. Anyway, it's the uh, uh, it's a situation where you have the possibility of a collision, and the red area in the vertical uh, velocity window there that you see on the attitude indicator depiction on the Airbus depiction says, "Okay, you see that little needle? It says get out of there, descend, and it will it'll tell you to descend, descend, and." Uh, the green area arrow is where you want to put the vertical velocity to make sure that you clear. Now on the Boeing, you have a similar thing, uh, same depiction. You've got the red bar over there on the uh, the vertical velocity indicator, and they also have a box up there that's basically don't fly into this box, fly out of this box, and that is the system that will get you away from uh, another aircraft. Now. Uh, I've had a few of these. Uh, mostly it's been light airplanes uh, that were in a place they shouldn't be. And you get a, uh, a resolution advisory and you follow it. Um, I've also had, now this was this was a lot of fun. I'm flying a 727 Captain from Chicago here to um, Phoenix, Arizona. And there's a stadium off the end of the runway I'm coming into. Uh, and there's a little dirigible down there. And, of course, to make the thing even more fun is I got an FAA guy giving me a line check. And actually, it, it, it was a lot of fun, you know, you, if you can say that having an FAA guy on your jump seat is fun ever. Uh, but it actually was a lot of fun because uh, he had been involved in certification and flight test. And, of course, with my ALPA work, I had spent decades in certification and flight test. So we had a very enjoyable discussion on the way in. But I'm coming in to land. Okay, I see the dirigible down there. That's fine. I get an RA, a resolutionary advisory off. It tells me to climb, climb, because the balloon. And uh, I told Tower, you know, I says, okay, you know, following the uh, the advisory, you know, you go through the, the typical steps, uh, steps. You disconnect the autopilot. Uh, you ignore the flight director because it's telling me to fly the ILS. You follow the TCAS and you inform ATC. And so I'm going around chewing up a couple thousand pounds and making everybody late for their uh, connections or their uh, loved ones. And, you know, I tell Tower, can you get that thing out of the way? I don't want to do another RA for your balloon down there. But anyway, I digress. Oh, t-shirts? I'm, I'm working on t-shirts. <laughs> but, okay, let's talk about this. Now, the PSA 727 
impacted. It actually hit a house, 3611 Nile Street, uh, three miles uh, northeast of Lindbergh Field. That's a, what you call the San Diego Airport. You're not familiar with that. And it was in a residential area known as North Park. The little uh, red uh, circle there uh, with the marker is the location of the actual crash site. And I'll show you it here a little uh, closer. It impacted uh, in a very steep angle. And I'll show you some of those pictures at 260 knots, nose down degree attitude, 50 degrees bank to the right. They actually use seismographic data to um, uh, determine uh, the exact moment that it impacted. And here's a little blown up. Just uh, 30 feet from Dwight and Nile Street is where the uh, 172 impacted. And the, uh, the Cessna uh, impacted the ground about uh, 300, uh, I'm sorry, 3,000 uh, feet uh, from this impact point. Now, uh, one thing interesting thing about this flight is they the uh, tower controllers had received a uh, an alert uh, from the uh, the radar system uh, that they had uh, that uh, you know there was a, a traffic conflict, but because supposedly um, the PSA crew said they had seen the Cessna and uh, they were, uh, you know, maneuvering uh, supposedly to avoid it. And the fact that these systems have false uh, warnings, false uh, alerts, they ignored it. Of course, uh, this was not the time to ignore it. And the aircraft impacted in a very populated area. Uh, the uh, photos, of course, um, were, there were a number of uh, people who, being a very populated area, were able to, to get these photos, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning photos. Actually, there were uh, some camera crews around for various events who, who were able uh, to take these photos. And this is the neighborhood area with the wreckage. And this is some of the aftermath of cleaning up uh, and going through the still smolder, smoldering wreckage site. And there, of course, you'll recognize as one of the engines off the 727. More crash area uh, photographs. Part of the fuselage of the uh, PSA 727. And of course, here is a depiction from the NTSB report of the general uh, service area, the terminal uh, radar service area surrounding um, Lindbergh Field that didn't have a lot of restrictions. Now, the one reason they were doing ILS approaches at Lindbergh Field was um, Montgomery Field and Gillespie, the other little airports around there, uh, did not have any uh, radar, any uh, uh, instrument facilities like ILS or localizer to practice any approaches. So if you wanted to uh, work on your instrument rating, you had to go down to the busy uh, Lindbergh field and Lindbergh uh, San Diego airport is the busiest single runway airport in the, uh, in the United States. Um, they quickly changed that and put facilities at other airports. Now, I, I've flown into Montgomery and uh, Gillespie a number of times in my uh, 310. And, of course, th this is very congested uh, airspace. It's uh, uh, very easy to fly out here in the Midwest. While I'm Okay, I'm right outside of O'Hare here. Now, that's a lot of uh, airspace. But as long as I go west or south, uh, you know, or uh, northwest, it's not too much of a problem. It gets wide open uh, in a big hurry. Uh, so it's, it's very uncongested. But flying up and down the west coast is, um, it keeps you on your toes. There's a lot going on. And, of course, the airspace has gotten a lot more uh, complicated now with the Class B overlays and things like that and the altitude restrictions and the uh, the requirements. Oh, oh, if you notice up there, uh, David's house, that's where my youngest son lives uh, with his wife, who is a Ph.D. geneticist. Uh, a very, very smart lady. And, and my son is in uh, uh, genetics also, and they both live out there. Now, here is um, a depiction of the Class B airspace, which uh, was overlaid on uh, San Diego and, and, other, any, um, and any other uh, high traffic area. And basically, uh, to go in there, okay, 
Uh, now, this would have been required to the 172 uh, as opposed to they could just operate out of their VFR. Now, to go in there, uh, you got to have an ATC clearance, you got to have a pilot certificate, um, or you got to have you can have a student certificate, but you have to have an endorsement, you have to have two way communications, and you have to have um, within 30 miles of there of the airports, you have to have a transponder and it gets, uh, you know, all sorts of requirements that you can read in the little list there. These are the little cards uh, that as flight instructors, instrument flight instructors, or, or civilian flight instructors too, uh, we hand out to our students so they have a reference to the various types of class uh, airspace that they have to adhere to and the, uh, the rules and the requirements and the considerations, weather visibility, things like this. Now, the NTSB concluded in their 1979 report that the probable cause was the failure of the PSA crew to follow proper air traffic control procedures. They had advised air traffic control that they had uh, visual contact with the Cessna 172, but they uh, failed to keep it in sight and um, uh, keep separation from it, and they listed that as a cause. Uh, as a finding, they listed the fact that the Cessna did not maintain its assigned heading, although the report found that if they had maintained their assigned heading, the collision wouldn't occur. They'd had about a 1,000 feet separation. But uh, that was only listed as a finding. It wasn't listed as a uh, probable cause. Now, McAdams didn't like that at all. And uh, in the final NTSB report, if you download it and, and look at the, uh, the PDF file, you'll see with big magic marker, the uh, probable cause is X'd out and uh, amended by, in 1982 um, by uh, Mr. McAdams' uh, comments. Now, uh, Francis McAdams, one of the board members, wrote a dissenting opinion, and he uh, provided a lot of uh, detail for his dissenting uh, opinion, but in the conclusions, he states, based on the foregoing, I state the probable cause as follows. Was a failure of the flight crew of Flight 182 to maintain visual separation and to advise the controller when visual contact was lost and the air traffic control procedures in effect which authorized the controllers to use visual separation procedures in a terminal area environment when the capability was available to provide either lateral or vertical radar separation to either aircraft. Contributing to the accident were... Failure of air traffic control system to establish procedures for the most effective use of conflict alert system at the San Diego Approach Control Facility. The failure of the controller to restrict PSA 182 to a 4,000 foot altitude until clear of the Montgomery Field Airport uh, traffic area. The improper resolution by the controller of the conflict alert. The uh, procedure whereby two separate air traffic control facilities were controlling traffic in the same airspace. The failure of the controller to advise PSA 182 of the direction uh, of movement of the Cessna. The failure of the Cessna to maintain the assigned heading. And the possible misidentification of the Cessna by PSA 182 due to the presence of a third unknown aircraft in the area. There are approximately 16 witnesses on the ground who report sighting a uh, third aircraft. Uh, and, uh, of course, like I mentioned before, part of uh, the whole thing with see and avoid is sometimes people will say, yes, I have the aircraft, and what they have in sight is the wrong aircraft. So that's why uh, the see and avoid can be so uh, dangerous, especially in a very heavy environment uh, such as this. Now, there was a plaque dedicated to the accident uh, victims, and it's actually located at the San Diego Aerospace Museum in Balboa Park, and it was put there at the uh, 20th anniversary of the uh, crash site. Now, it's interesting. I've been to the Aerospace Museum in San Diego. Um, actually, I went with a Gemini astronaut there, and he pointed out uh, uh, some things. Uh, that was Gordon Fullerton. And he pointed out some things uh, that the museum had on display that uh, were his that he had given to the museum. So that was, that was kind of a, a fun little time. I digress. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, I've actually, uh, this is out by a tree, I guess, somewhere, and I've, I've never uh, seen it that I'm aware of. So uh, when I go back there to, to visit my son, you know, the David's house thing, uh, I'm going to have to take a look for it. Of course, one of the tragic aspects about this accident was the fact that we have the cockpit voice recorder, so we knew what the, we know what the crew was talking about in their final moments, and the crew knew they had hit the aircraft uh, once they had had the impact, and they knew they were going down. And it's 
you know, if you've ever been in a situation where you have to go in and listen to a CVR and you listen to it as a crew member who knows the crew members you're listening to, you're listening to this, these guys' voices as, as they're about to die and you're identifying, yeah, that's the co-pilot. Yeah, I know him. That's the engineer. And that, that's one of the very uh, difficult aspects of accident investigation. Another thing that came out uh, about this, and it, it wasn't cited as contributing to the accident, but uh, this was pre-sterile cockpit where below 10,000 feet, you only discuss items relevant to conducting the flight. You don't tell jokes. And of course, there were a few jokes and, and uh, comments that were not necessary to the proper conduct of the flight uh, that were made in there. Uh, that didn't really um, contribute to the accident as such. It, it didn't help it. It probably took their focus away from looking as much as they should. But there, there's another aspect um, to uh, this accident in PSA that, that's uh, um, rather interesting uh, in, a, in a tragic uh, fashion. There was a Don St. Germain, who was an employee of PSA, um, was aboard this flight, and, and he died with 143 passengers and crews. Uh, nine years later, his brother-in-law, Douglas Arthur, who was a PSA pilot, was killed aboard PSA Flight 171, uh, along with 42 other people, when a recently fired employee, uh, Burke, uh, shot his former boss, a flight attendant, and the two pilots uh, before he sent the airplane into a, uh, a nosedive. And... Uh, so what happened was Nikki St. Germain lost her brother in the first ever deadly crash of a PSA flight and her husband in the second. These are the only two deadly crashes in the 40 years of the airline. And of course, uh, as a flight crew member, it used to be a lot easier uh, to get through security in that. And most of the time we did not go through security. We just uh, showed our badges and we went right on through. Well, the guy who got on board this flight, he was a PSA employee and uh, um, he just showed his badge and got on with a gun. So, well, guess what happens? Everything uh, gets uh, tightened down. And, of course, you'd say, well, uh, they should just do that for employees. Pilots, you can trust. Well, of course, I'll talk about the, uh, the FedEx where the pilot got on board and tried to uh, kill the other pilots to uh, uh, fake a, an accident and collect insurance. So, uh, you know, uh, pilots uh, aren't pure either. So, anyway... Uh, that's the story of PSA Flight 182, a flight I remember very well because of my, uh, uh, you know, as an active pilot at the time, and a, a, a very uh, tragic uh, flight, but not the last of a, a mid-air collision that led to the development of TCAS. And there's another one, uh, the Cerritos accident, that, that I'll also talk about here in just a bit. Anyway, thanks for watching. I appreciate it.